Welcome to SCA's webinar with Dr. Amy Fox on Can Geomechanics Improve Your Drilling and Completions? Spoiler alert, yes. Before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the demographics of our audience. So if you look at your control panel, I will be bringing you some polling questions. The first question is, what is your primary discipline? So please tell us if you're a petroleum engineer, geoscience, facility engineering, petrophysics, or other. Looks like we're getting quite a few geoscientists in this crowd, about 60, 70%, and the rest, uh, the second most popular is petroleum engineering. So almost all of you have voted, so I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll and share the results. 65% geoscience, 25% petroleum engineering, and a smattering of petrophysics and other disciplines. So let's do the next polling question. How many years of experience, full-time experience, do you have in the upstream oil and gas industry? So we're starting to get our responses here. Uh, looks like we have a good distribution among all the different uh, ranges. So most of you appear to be in the 11 to 20 year range of experience. Almost everyone's voted, so I'm going to go ahead and close this and share the results uh, with 45% in the 1 to 10 year range and 32% in the 11 to 20 year range. So thanks for that. So before I introduce Dr. Fox, I'd like to remind our audience that uh, you are muted, but you can ask questions using your uh, control panel on the GoToWebinar question feature, and we'll try to cover most, if not all, of the questions at the end of the presentation today. You will, of course, be anonymous, so feel free to ask any question you wish. So I'm going to start with the um, introductory remarks, and uh, Dr. Fox is doing this webinar today on Can Geomechanics Improve Your Drilling and Completions? Spoiler alert, yes. Amy Fox earned her undergraduate degree in geology from University of New Hampshire. After that, she uh, pursued master's and PhD degrees in geophysics from Stanford and started consulting there in Palo Alto with Geomechanics International. Uh, her thesis was characterization and modeling of in-situ stress heterogeneity. GMI asked Amy to lead their training program and career progression for their technical staff. Uh, the company was acquired by Baker Hughes in 2008 and uh, in 2011, Amy returned to operations in Canada. Uh, Amy is a, a popular author and speaker at uh, various industry events, and she's very passionate about geomechanics, and so we hope you will uh, get the sense of that today. Uh, Amy teaches a class entitled Reservoir Scale Geomechanics. This is being offered in July in Houston, Texas, and so there are some of the details of this class. Uh, this is offered at SCA's office, but it's also available to be brought in-house to your location in a private class. Um, here's some information about how you can register for this class or get more information about holding the class in-house. And of course, this is part of our series of free webinars. Um, the next ones we have scheduled, um, SCA's chief geologist, Bob Shoup, will be speaking in mid-May on Would You Recommend Drilling a Dry Hole? And at the end of May, we have uh, Dr. Med Kamel uh, speaking about uh, PTA and uh, the use of reservoir absolute permeability in multi-phase flow conditions. So of course, SCA, in addition to training, we also do consulting, direct hire uh, services, projects, and studies. And there's some information if you'd like to contact us. So I'm going to pass the presentation rights to Amy and Amy, I'll let you take it away. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, excellent. And can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. I'm gonna put this in presentation mode and minimize my control panel and we're good. Okay, um, well, thank you for that introduction. That was very nice and thanks for this opportunity to give a little preview to some of the topics that'll be in my course in July. <clears throat> um, 
So yeah, uh, the title is Can Geomechanics Improve Your Drilling and Completions? And I say spoiler, yes, because I feel like there's always a way that we can use geomechanics to improve operations, both in the drilling and the completion side. So I'm gonna start um, my introduction with a lot of numbers. Uh, I know I, I disobey every rule of PowerPoint and that don't put a lot of text in numbers, but we're talking about numbers here. We're talking about improving our drilling and completions and, and that's a numbers game. So this is a, a little study I did a few years ago uh, on the Montney play. It's an unconventional play, very hot right now here in Western Canada. And uh, I wanted to just see, because we have a lot of public data available to us here, so I can go in and mine that data to see how companies are performing. And what you see here, I'm gonna turn on a pointer. What you see here are about a 10 to 12 companies here. Um, I didn't wanna name them, but these ones are greater. And then in the next column, you see uh, the number of wells they drilled and of those, the number that went over the drilling AFE. So of course it required that I had access to both the AFE and the actual costs. So uh, there's a caveat there, but here's what I found. Um, the total AFE for wells that went over in millions of dollars is in the next column, and those are some pretty big numbers. The total drilling costs for the wells that went over, also in millions of dollars, is in the next column, and unfortunately, those are even bigger than the previous column. And then if you kind of take the difference and you divide by the number of wells that went over AFE, you see that these wells were ranging anywhere from uh, about 300,000 to almost 2 million over AFE per well. And so these costs really add up and uh, it'd be nice to, to get them down. So when I mention problems, I'm usually confronted with people who say, yeah, but that's all on the rig, right? That's waiting time, that somebody dropped a wrench down the hole. Who knows, it's, it's not geomechanics. Well, um, I have a colleague who is with this company, Shared Earth Solutions, and, and he, and a couple of drilling engineers, what they do is they do part of my workflow, which is they mine through the daily drilling reports and the completion reports and try to find out exactly where money was lost. So sort of a, a post-mortem thing. So um, in this study, they were looking at the Duvernay, another hot play here in Canada, and they divided out the lost time and um, problems by mechanical problems, so rig related or waiting for loggers or whatever, what have you. Um, and uh, they separated that out from formation related problems. So here's uh, their Duvernay study. They looked at 103 wells and um, they totaled up all the problems that were related to mechanical NPT. And what they found was it came to about $17 million in lost cost because of these problems. And so, yep, that's an awfully big number. Um, but in the same study, if we look at the formation related NPT or non-productive time, what they found was $18.5 million lost to formation related problems. And most of these, if you go in in a proactive mode instead of a reactive mode, you can avoid. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, what has all this got to do with geomechanics? So I'm gonna have to uh, give you a little intro to what geomechanics is all about. The key parameters we're concerned about in geomechanics are the in-situ stresses in the earth, and we have three principal stresses, and we need to know their orientations and their magnitudes, and then um, the rock properties, the mechanical rock properties, and the fluid pressures in the rock. So, really are the building blocks of geomechanics. And uh, the stresses are related to plate tectonics, as you would expect, and they vary throughout the world. This is a snapshot from the world stress map. Um, it's just showing North America. And what you're seeing here are a bunch of little symbols. And for each symbol, the long direction indicates the direction of the maximum horizontal stress. And then the colors tell you whether you're in a normal faulting regime, strike slip regime, or a thrust faulting regime. And this just tells us what are the relative magnitudes of the principal stresses. And you can see it varies quite a bit. It can, you can get multiple colors even in one area. 
California is a great example because you get so much going on around the San Andreas Fault. The symbols in the middle of each of these tick marks, they tell you what kind of data the stress directions came, and magnitudes came from. Uh, the circles are focal mechanisms from earthquakes, and you see a lot of colored circles on the map. What you also see is in areas where we're producing oil and gas, so Western Canada, Texas, um, offshore Canada, Eastern Canada, you see a lot of black symbols. And that just means that we don't know the relative stress magnitudes because the data type that was analyzed doesn't tell us that. or wasn't used in a, in a larger modeling um, approach to get those stress magnitudes. So we're lacking knowledge of the stress magnitudes in a lot of our oil and gas operating areas. And uh, they really are important. And we need to not only understand what they are um, in the earth before we drill the well, but we need to understand how they change when we drill the well or when we hydraulically fracture. I was astounded the first time I ever heard an say that the amount of prop that they put pumped into the ground was equivalent to 200 train cars of sand. We are making massive changes to the earth stresses when we do these things. So what does geomechanics mean? It varies throughout the industry a little bit, um, especially recently with the rise of things like uh, mini frac interpretation. So I meet quite a few people now who say, well, yeah, I do geomechanics, but they, they don't really do the full geomechanical workflow. They, um, maybe they, they're a specialist at interpreting mini fracks and that's great, but they need to understand how that fits into the bigger picture. So again, this is kind of a busy slide, but I use it a lot. I think it's very instructive. Um, what you have are in blue, you have kind of individual analysis types. And then down in the green, you have all the applications that those are applied to. And you can very easily see that right here in the middle is a big old bottleneck. So situ stress determination is really the goal when we're interpreting, when we're doing these types of analyses, they should go through an in situ stress determination and then apply to these various problems such as sand production, hydraulic fracture modeling, cap rock integrity, uh, drilling recommendations. So you really can't skip that step. If you do, you're really just getting part of the picture, not the whole picture. So let's focus in on drilling now. And usually when I'm giving this as a live uh, seminar or course, I use a sponge to kind of illustrate um, and define the wellbore stress concentration. So I'm gonna try to do it with my poor uh, PowerPoint visual skills here. Um, so imagine you have a sponge and you put a hole in the sponge and then you squeeze the sponge. Um, obviously what's going to happen is that hole is going to turn into an oval. And what's really happening is you're creating areas of tension on either side of the hole and areas of compression, 90 degrees to that. And the same kind of stresses um, occur around a wellbore when you drill a well into a stressed rock. But of course, rock isn't like a sponge, so it doesn't necessarily turn into an oval. It may stay circular, but you still have that tension and compression. So here's a, a wellbore cross section, cartoon obviously, and it's showing wellbore breakouts here and here, and then tensile cracks here and here. And uh, the stress concentration that surrounds the well is what creates these features. And the stress concentration persists for about two borehole, two to three borehole radii away from the well, pretty strong right at the well bore wall. And it's a, con it's a combination of um, the in-situ stresses, their orientations and magnitudes, the mechanical rock properties, especially the rock strength, the tensile and compressive strength, the formation pressures, and then the mud weight in the hole and the hole orientation. And what's key to all of this is that we can control some of these aspects, right? We can't control the in situ stress or the rock strength, but we can control our mud weight and our hole orientation. So for practical purposes, uh, we generally say that we want to have an upper limit on wellbore breakouts. And uh, the way we measure them is via their angular width. So you take a single breakout on one side of the well and 
determine the angular width of that. And um, the limits that we put on in practice are generally, we say we want to keep that within 90 degrees in a vertical well, and we reduce that to 60 for horizontal, maybe even less, uh, just because it gets trickier to clean out that horizontal well bore, especially if it's a really long lateral. Um, and then for tensile fractures, uh, some tensile fractures are, are fine. They're only at the well bore wall and they don't go out into the formation. But the problem with them is that once you initiate them, you run the risk of kind of creating a small hydraulic fracture by accident and um, losing circulation. And then once you lose circulation, uh, that can create a lot of other problems, including uh, lowering your mud weight, which may then exacerbate breakout problems. And so you, it's best to avoid it. Now, why do we want to limit breakout width? A lot of wells have breakouts and it's not an issue. Well, the problem is when they get too large. Um, what you see over here is a microscopic image of a laboratory created breakout in a small piece of rock. And you see these chunks of rock have broken off here. And so when the breakout forms, it's actually forming by chunks of rock breaking out and falling into the well bore. And so you get a build of cuttings and cavings in the annulus. It becomes harder to clean the holes. You can get cutting beds building up, especially in deviated wells. Um, it can actually increase your mud weight and then you know, increase the risk of tensile fractures. Um, also, if you get, especially if you get beyond that 90 degrees in a vertical well, you really have a severe risk of the hole washing out entirely. And that means that the entire hole becomes enlarged and you're going to have large chunks of rock um, you're likely to get stuck pipe and pack off and issues like that. Another thing that we don't think about much is that uh, maybe the hole drilled okay with some breakouts, but uh, what about cementing? How does that affect our cementing operations in terms of cement volumes, getting a good bond, uh, things like that? And then also in completions, how much is this affecting our completions, especially if we're trying to pack off a section of the well? Um, if we're trying to perforate into the rock, a whole lot of cement to get through. So there are other issues besides just drilling where you might want to have what I like to call a healthy borehole. So uh, a hole that doesn't have um, severe breakouts. So the real mud weight window, I call it the real mud weight window because there's this um, general kind of rule of thumb out there in a lot of areas where people think you just have to keep the mud weight um, above the formation pressure and you want to keep it as low as possible above the formation pressure because it'll keep your ROP up. Uh, and just don't exceed the minimum stress because that you might fracture the rock. Well, because of that wellbore stress concentration, these may not be the actual limits that you need to pay attention to. What you need to do is keep the mud weight above the limit where you're gonna have excessive breakouts, but below the point at which you're gonna initiate tensile fracturing. So over here on the right, I have an example screenshot from um, one commercial geomechanic software package that's out there. And I'll walk you through it here. So we've got a lithology log here where you just see sands versus shales. Um, in the next track, we have the whole azimuth in blue and the deviation in red, so you see it over this interval, the hole is increasing in deviation. In the next uh, track here, we have our pore pressure in blue, um, the actual mud weight used to drill this particular well in black, and our fracture gradient, or the point at which we're going to initiate tensile failure in the well here in green. And then the red track, the one that jumps all over the place, that is what our the mud weight we need uh, to stay above in order to avoid excessive breakouts. And the reason it changes so much over depth is because we're going through different formations with different properties. The hole orientation is changing. Possibly the pore pressures are, well, they are. We can chart here. The pore pressures are changing with depth. So all of these things factor into that number, that lower limit on the mud weight. So the real mud window, mud weight window, is between this red line and the green line. And so sometimes that's below the formation pressure. You could drill under balance through this section, but down here you have to have a significantly higher mud weight to get through that zone, probably because that's a weak shale. So 
this is the, the actual mud weight window, but you also have to consider, um, okay, so I'm gonna drill this under balanced, but this part of the hole here is um, still exposed. And so what's gonna happen? You're gonna get excessive breakouts up here while you're drilling down here with this mud weight. So what you really need to consider is what's the mud window for the entire hole section. So that's what this last track is showing you. It's showing you the practical mud weight window to stay, uh, to keep excessive breakouts from happening over that entire hole section. So what are some clues uh, that we're having geomechanical issues? There are actually a lot. And um, one of the first things I do in a geomechanical analysis is read through the daily drilling reports and talk to the client about um, what kind of things they noticed while the well was being drilled. Um, for example, um, if they're having hole cleaning problems, high volumes of cuttings on the shakers, um, tight hole, pack off, over pull, these are all signs that breakouts are occurring. And especially, um, many people are surprised to learn that the shape of cavings that come over the shaker can also be a clue as to what's going on down hole. So as soon as I find that there's been cavings, I always ask the client if they have pictures. These are uh, an example of what we call splintery or sometimes called and they are a clear indication that the breakouts are forming. Um, so some other clues, um, if you see cavings that are sort of what we say platy or tabular in nature, um, that gives us a hint that there's probably anisotropic rock strength, which means that the rock is weaker in one direction than in another. So that could be related to weak bedding planes, for example. Um, some others are uh, differential sticking, lost circulation, at lower than expected pressures. You may be drilling through a depleted or an under pressured zone. And then I haven't mentioned it, but here this last column is basically some of the things we see happening um, to mitigate these problems. So we may not have uh, exact data that anything in, in these problems are happening, but we see them in totally uh, continuing to increase the mud weight or um, going back and having to ream and clean zones repeatedly. And so these are all hints that there's stuff going on. Um, shows, inflows, kicks, those are uh, a clue that we might be going through an overpressured zone. Um, low rate of penetration might be occurring because of your excess of cuttings and cavings. Um, so you may be kind of shooting yourself in the foot by using a low mud weight if you think that's gonna increase your ROP, but it actually increases problems and decreases your ROP. So uh, just a few more issues here. If you see kind of rubbly cavings, that's a good indication that you're penetrating mud into pre-existing natural fractures and uh, the, that material is coming off into the hole. Another really common thing is well bore breathing or ballooning. You'll see that in the drilling reports. And that often means you're losing circulation into pre existing fractures. And then when you back off the pressure, that um, circulation comes back into the hole. And then a few more. So, if you're total loss circulation, that usually means you've unintentionally created a hydraulic fracture. Um, Swelling shales are often an indication that you've got a chemical issue and uh, oil-based mud is generally used to, to deal with that. And then steering problems even might be an indication that you have fractures or breakouts or uh, lithology changes that are affecting how the bit wants to dig into the rock. A few other geomechanical issues that are often related to drilling. Um, might be shear failure along pre-existing shear planes. So you might experience bridging off in the well or casing shear after the well is completed. Um, rapid or large stress changes near uh, faults or salt bodies can be a really important issue, uh, particularly areas like the Gulf of Mexico, where there are large salt diapirs. The salt is plastic and, and can't support its shear stress. So then, in situ shear stress in the surrounding rock, that has to change very quickly as you get into the salt body. Sand production from under consolidated or unconsolidated reservoirs is an issue in some parts of the world. And um, 
Deep water brings another problem with it in that you get very small mud weight windows. And as we know, um, not managing that mud weight well enough can lead to some really serious problems in these types of environments. So uh, what I consider to be a really seminal paper came out in 2010, an SPE paper by Fred Dupriest. He was at ExxonMobil for decades, uh, now is at, the, at Texas A&M, a distinguished professor there. And um, he and I speak the same language when it comes to drilling issues and mitigating them and paying attention to them. And I'm gonna show you a couple of graphics from that paper. I'm gonna start with a quote. It is a long one, but I think it's important. And the most important part here is in yellow. So all these things I've been talking about, tight hole, pack offs, you know, they're often considered just sort of the cost of drilling a well, it's, it's built in. But what they really result in is hidden costs. So we tend to pass them off and we don't really, we don't add them up, we don't account for them. And it turns out they're not needed. Um, so, and in his study of hundreds of ExxonMobil wells, he found that on a global basis, the hidden costs um, were believed to be greater than the actual NPT that was, that was tracked. So um, they, this study was found a really important link between reducing those hidden costs and geomechanics. So they had a, a couple of these triangles plots in their paper, which I really, really like. Um, this one addresses when you should act. So the best time to act is um, when you're thinking, okay, we might be expecting some, uh, let's call it formation related NPT. So do we wanna redesign the well to account for those risks? Um, the next best time is when you've had kind of a near miss in the past and you realize, ooh, we don't, we don't really wanna go there again, what can we do to avoid that next time? Um, then the second worst time is when you have a real time near miss. There's a lot of talk about real time geomechanics uh, over the past few years, and that's great, but it shouldn't really be done without um, some preliminary geomechanics having been done. And then you can kind of modify as you go, as you experience things in real time, but you need a basic model to start with. And then the absolute worst time is when you're stuck. And unfortunately, that's usually when I get a phone call <laughs> is when a client stuck or had a, a total runaway well, and then they call and say, well, what can we do about this? And then the, the second uh, chart here, it just kind of shows what, what you could do at these various stages uh, to try to mitigate problems. So, you know, if you start early, you can model, you can get a good geomechanical model together and predict your mud weights and, and try to avoid problems in the first place. Um, if you've had a near miss, well, that's data. You can use that information to um, work that into your geomechanical model um, to try to prevent it again. Um, if you've had a real time near miss, uh, raise your mud weights, probably the first thing to do unless you really are convinced it's gonna cause other problems. And then, um, you know, if you end up with a runaway well, you really need to do a root cause analysis um, and go back and try to figure out why that happened. And one of the most shocking things that came out of that paper, people's eyebrows always go up when I say it, is that what they found was really just use the highest possible mud weight. And you are not gonna decrease your ROP um, so much that it's gonna, um, be more important than, than not having all these problems. So there's a lot of arguments against using higher mud weights. I hear them every day. Um, one, it will lower ROP. I think there are some studies out there that have shown that they're really, the link is not as, as close as people think it is, um, especially because of these problems that it might happen, uh, that might happen with low mud weights. Um, it will cause bit dysfunction. Um, it will worsen formation damage. It will cause lost circulation. That is a possibility. Um, it might penetrate into natural fractures um, and we might wanna drill under balance. I'll get to that one in a minute. These are all arguments um, they, for not using a higher mud weight, but um, 
they, most of them can be dealt with in other ways. So for bit dysfunction, if you have designed your BHA correctly, you can usually um, mitigate that. Um, for lost circulation, we can calculate that. We can figure out what mud weight's going to cause lost circulation, and you can either try to stay below that or be prepared for some lost circulation, have lost circulation material on hand, for example. So um, the, they're valid arguments, but um, not that helpful if you know you end up with a totally um, washed out well. So Underbalanced drilling um, is using a mud weight that's under the formation pressure, and there's pros and cons to it. Uh, there's reasons people want to do it, maybe to produce fluids while they're drilling. Um, some of the pros are, you know, reducing the formation damage, maybe increasing ROP, uh, and producing fluids while drilling. Some of the cons are that you have to have specialized equipment and training, et cetera. And also the formation has to be suited to it. So you need a mechanically stable and chemically non-reactive formation. And um, we're doing a lot of drilling in shales these days, and neither one of these properties is very common in shales. So it's something to keep in mind. All right, so with that, I'm going to wrap up the drilling part. And I'm just going to check the time here because I can't see it on my computer. OK, perfect. Um, I'm going to switch to completions now. So I went back and made a timeline of completions because I'm always, uh, for a long time now, I've been telling people, well, the discipline of geomechanics hasn't really kept up um, or has had trouble keeping up with the advancements being made in completions and um, need geomechanics input. Um, but I, I never really put dates to that. And so I just recently decided to make this little timeline. And what it shows is that you know, hydraulic fracturing has been around for decades. We know that. And, and there were some attempts to model the fractures very early on, back in the 50s, say. And uh, in about five or six years from the time it was first introduced, uh, about 100,000 treatments had been performed. So it, it caught on fairly quickly. But then it, it didn't really enter mainstream until about the 80s and the 90s um, when uh, the government kind of wanted it to wanted research and development to happen regarding hydraulic fracturing and companies started experiencing some success uh, particularly with multi-stage hydraulic fractures so um around the early 2000s is when it really take off both mshf multi-stage hydraulic fracturing and as we all know horizontal drilling as well um, played into that. We drill long laterals now, and we uh, perform lots of frats in those laterals. So starting about 2010 is when I kind of saw hydraulic fracturing, I'd say, explode. Um, at least it wasn't something that in, in my career we had been concerning ourselves with very much, only in very specialized cases, and suddenly it became mainstream. And we didn't really have the tools um, available to really understand what was going on. So for example, Gopher is one of the most common hydraulic fracture models. That was introduced back in the 80s, but it was for uh, single stage fracks in vertical wells, and then was a 2D model, somewhat simplistic. I mean, sophisticated for its time, but what we, we might consider now simplistic. And it's only in the past years that I've seen viable commercial 3D models for multi-stage hydraulic fracturing come out. So, okay, um, why not just pump and pray, which is what some people do? Why do we even want to model our hydraulic fractures? Well, this chart, it's a little outdated now, but what it shows is that drilling costs, um, pretty much, or well costs, sorry, just kind of stayed pretty steady up until about, um, 2001, and then in seven years, it increased by 350%. And that is directly linked to horizontal wells and hydraulic fracturing. So I, I think what we have here is a really good opportunity to optimize. So these modern models, they account for a lot of geomechanical 
issues. Um, for one thing, they're, th they're three-dimensional. Uh, they account for multiple states. They allow for asymmetrical fractures. Um, one of the big ones now is stage-to-stage -stage stress interference because we're trying to, in a lot of cases, shorten our frac spacing, and that's putting our fracs nearer to each other. And we know we're changing the stress when we frac, so we need to understand how each stage is influenced by that. Um, some of these models can include structural controls on fracture propagation, interaction with natural fractures. Um, some of them include the ability to analyze mini fracs and uh, make production forecasts, and some of them are real-time enabled. So I just, from the web, I grabbed a couple of screenshots here of uh, a modern gopher model from um, Barry and Associates and uh, a 3D model by FracGeo. And I, I did a little search a little while ago. I think I found about 15 commercial software packages that have some or all of the features listed here. Problem with these models is they're great, but if we thought our earlier models needed data, these really need data. In order to understand interaction with natural fractures, for example, we need to know what natural fractures are um, intersected by the well bore. So you, you can't just um, run these models with a couple of input parameters and some defaults and assumptions and expect to get very accurate results out of them. Another big issue, uh, geomechanics related in, in completions is induced seismicity. So we're seeing this in various parts of the world. Um, this is a, a little plot I got off of the Oklahoma Geological Survey's website, and it just shows historical earthquakes in Oklahoma. I mean, Oklahoma's always had earthquakes, so um, that's not news, but the quantity is definitely increasing. So you see the light. Is 1882 to 2008. Um, the dark blue is over a three year period, 2009 to 2012. And then the green is just in 2013. The yellow is just in 2014. And all this red was one month in 2015. So, uh, of course, it's a concern. We know it's geomechanically related uh, to either injection or hydraulic fracturing. Um, the problem. Uh, there's definitely risk to infrastructure and so on. And so it's a definite concern and it may affect our operations in terms of casing integrity and so on. But one of the big challenges is just the public perception. Um, I grabbed this graphic here um, because I wanted to show how, you know, it's actually not a bad article about induced seismicity, but the, the image they show shows this giant crack in the earth coming from an oil well and you know that's what the public is, and it becomes very scary uh, another important issue these days in hydraulic fracturing is frac hits um, this is from the eagleford training uh, company out of san antonio and um, they have some really good educational materials up on their website and this is their their page on frac hits. So what I mean by frac hits is when uh, you're fracturing in one well and you um, accidentally affect another well. So you either, um, you know, you either, either inject fluids or prop in, into the other well or a fracture connected to that well. Or a lot of times this causes drastic reductions in production in the OSA well. So um, these are becoming an increasing concern. Again, we're not just decreasing our fracture space in these days, but we're decreasing our well spacing. And so we need to understand how one well is going to affect the other wells. And one of the biggest factors in this is understanding the stresses and the geomechanics, as you can see down here at the bottom. And I, I do see some changes coming out of this prolonged downturn. And one of them is, um, people considering geologically staging their fracks. And uh, I know of at least one company here in Western Canada that has publicly said, yes, we're gonna geologically stage our fracks because it's, it's pretty well known that many frac stages don't contribute to production. And so it would be nice to avoid those and not have to pay for those because they're very expensive. So this is a, an example from just a paper that was published a few years ago now where they considered um, 
they did a, a very detailed petrophysical analysis and um, determined, you know, the, the geologically staged completions based on a whole bunch of different input parameters, including um, some permeability, water saturation, TOC, uh, rock properties, uh, closure stress. So all of these, they had their own set of criteria, what made a good frack stage and where, where to stop each stage. And their final design went from a 15 stage geometric completion to an 11 stage uh, geologic completion. And then another example that's a little bit different here is um, that this is a, something I put together from two related SPE papers listed here, where um, there was a multi-stage hydraulic fracture along a lateral, um, and then a production log was run a few months after the, month, the um, well was brought on production. And it showed what I just said, which is that some of the stages were really contributing to production and others weren't, um, and wanted to understand what was going on. So they looked at a bunch of different factors to try to figure out what was going on. And one of the things they did was they had image logs over the lateral. So they went in and identified all the natural fractures in their image logs, and they tried to compare fracture density to production. And there wasn't really a very good correlation. So um, they decided to look a little deeper. And so to explain what they looked at, I need to hit the pause button here for a second and just explain one concept. And that's the concept of critically stressed fractures. And Again, when I'm doing this live, I usually use a book or somebody's cell phone to illustrate this, but I, I'm gonna have to do it with my limited um, graphics abilities here. So pretend this is a book and it's sitting on a table and it's a nice flat table. So the stresses acting on that book are the normal stress, which is just the weight of the book. And there's no shear stress on the book. Now, if I tilt the table, uh, I'm getting some shear stress on the book. The normal stress is going down, the shear stress is going up, but it's not sliding yet because there's some friction there. There's some frictional strength that's keeping that in place. But if I continue to tilt it, eventually I'm going to overcome the shear strength and make that book slide. The same thing happens with natural fractures in the, uh, when the earth stresses are acting on the fractures, there are some that are like, this fracture, which is strong, you know, it, it hasn't, the shear stress hasn't exceeded its shear strength. And then there are some that are more like this. And when that happens in a rock, there's my lovely cartoon rock. If you slide it, it's not a nice flat surface and it's going to have some rugosity to it, maybe some um, gouge, and that's going to create a pathway for fluid flow. So we call these critically stressed fractures. And so in our study, what they did was they mapped out the density of just the critically stressed fractures, and they found a, an interesting correlation between the critically stressed fracture density and the production, particularly here towards the toe of the well where we had lots of fractures, um, sorry, very little completion and very few critically stressed fractures. So I'm gonna uh, wind up here and end on what I call a new act for geomechanics. So um, in my career, I've seen it change from mostly drilling related redu risk reduction focus in terms of drilling directions and mud weights and all that stuff we talked about earlier to suddenly what I call newer concerns, which are um, concerns with our completions and production and geomechanics certainly there as well. What we may have is a situation where um, it's a, a bit of a trade-off between uh, getting the well we want and getting the completion we want. Um, it reminds me of this sign you sometimes see on people's office doors, fast, good, cheap. Is it a situation where we have to pick two? We can't have all three? It may be, but with proper geomechanical modeling, we can answer a lot of these questions and um, potentially optimize our drilling completions and, and reduce a lot of costs. So uh, I'm gonna end there and um, hand it back over to the 
good folks at FCA to uh, manage questions. Thank you, Amy. So I want to remind our listeners today that you are muted, but you can post your questions in the question box there in the webinar feature. Uh, later today, you'll receive a link to a recording of today's webinar. Uh, we'll ask you to fill out an evaluation form, and um, you'll get registration details for the class that Amy Fox will be teaching on Reservoir Scale Geomechanics offered in July in Houston. So, Amy, could you talk a little bit more about frac hits? Um, you alluded to that, I think, on slide 35. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, it's something that's definitely becoming um, more prevalent in the industry. Um, people are just sort of becoming aware of it, and we're wrapping our heads around it. But um, one of the most important things to understand there is stress orientations and just how um, how different the stress magnitudes are and how that's going to control uh, where your fracs go and how far your fracs go. And some of these new newer models can help us determine that. Is there anything more specific? No, thank you. Um, the next question, can we eliminate the risk of tensile fracture by designing our mud weight? Absolutely. We, we can calculate uh, the mud weight at which we're going to get tensile fractures. And then we can avoid that. Um, one key thing there, however, is uh, managing surge and swab issues. Um, so if, if you're, say, um, tripping into the hole too fast and you create sort of a, a surge, a pressure surge that goes up, you may have your overall mud weight where you want it, but then when you create that surge, you may uh, just temporarily increase the mud weight and cause a tensile fracture. So the, the two steps there is to, to one, calculate it, when it's going to happen, and then manage your mud weight to stay below that. Okay. Um, you showed an example where the uh, critical stress fractures were directly correlatable to production. How can we design our fractures to accomplish that more often? Really nice question. Um, so what we can do there is we can, we can quantify the stresses and their orientation, and then we can calculate which fractures, if they exist, would be critically stressed. And then we can design our wells to intersect um, more of those. So obviously, if you drill a horizontal well, you're going to have a higher probability of intersecting um, vertical fractures. Or if you drill a vertical well, you have a higher probability of intersecting horizontal fractures. Likewise, if we figure out that, say, fractures dipping 45 degrees to the northeast are critically stressed, we can design a well that will intersect more of those. Okay. Um, I think you mentioned that in deep water, there's a small window of mud weights, and, and you were showing the Macondo well as an example. So how do we uh, mitigate risk with that small window of mud weights? A great question. There are a lot of operational ways to do that. So the, the first step there is to calculate what that mud window is. Part of the um, issue there is just the very deep water contributing to a much higher pore pressure than you would get at depth uh, than if you were on shore. But um, there are various methodologies uh, called managed pressure drilling, which um, allow you to have a very tight control on the, on the mud weight down hole. Um, I can't, I'm not going to get into it because there's different methodologies, but that term, managed pressure drilling, if you look that up, you'll find uh, a lot of information especially um, I'm seeing it increasingly in uh, journals like the Journal of Petroleum Technology by SPE. I'm seeing um, an increase in the number of articles addressing managed pressure drilling. Can you briefly describe a workflow to evaluate the presence of critically stressed fractures? Um, uh, let me think about that for a minute to evaluate this. Well, so, um, I mentioned earlier that we'd figure out the stresses and then we figure out which orientations would be critically stressed in that stress environment. Um, to evaluate whether or not we have any critically stressed fractures, we would need to actually have some image logs or some other way to um, select, to, to characterize our fracture population and then see how many of those are in that critically stressed orientation. 
Um, another way you might be able to get some information on that is, uh, I know my very first project on that dealt with this concept was actually in a geothermal field where we were identifying um, fractures on image logs and then correlating those to um, uh, spinner data and temperature data that indicated which fractures were actually contributing to the to the well and um, we were able to tie that back to those fractures being critically stressed so to really identify whether or not you have them you're going to need to collect some extra data thank you how important is the brittleness estimation when you design the number of stages <laughs> Any, if there's anybody out there who knows me, they know I hate the B word. Um, brittleness. Uh, <laughs> yeah, brittleness. Um, a, a lot of us see it as a really kind of gross oversimplification of a lot of complicated um, rock properties information. Uh, but it has seemed to be helpful in some fields. Uh, whether or not you apply it in a given field is, uh, you know, you really need to determine if it's applicable. But in a more general sense, um, understanding rock properties and selecting which parts of the well to complete based on that is a, a viable workflow and can be really important. How different operators choose to do that really varies across a very broad spectrum, so it's hard to give a specific answer to that. Okay, next question. Could you please discuss the importance of acquiring good data, such as well test data, production data, image logs, et cetera? Uh, I think it's very important, um, but I'm not paying for it, so it's mm -hmm. easy for me to say that. Um, I, I have seen uh, a decrease throughout this downturn. I've seen a decrease in data collection, obviously, because people are trying to cut costs. But now we've turned a corner and we're saying, well, we really need to optimize, um, but we have no data with which to do that. So um, it's it's a problem. I think, I hope we'll see data collection start to increase. But one of the um, primary, it, it, it usually ends up being very important in a geomechanical study to explain to the client what parts of the geomechanical model are the most uncertain. So, um, for example, I'm working on a project now where I don't have any rock strength data and I'm trying to quantify the stress magnitudes, but without that rock strength data, um, there's a trade off. Because I can say, sure, if the rock strength is this, then the stress is this, or I can say, well, the stress can be this and we'll still see what we see in the wells if the rock strength is this. But it, I don't really know either one for sure. So I can go to the client and say, can we, you know, if this is really important to you, can we run some core tests and get some good rock strength data? And that will tighten up the model really well. Right. It sounds like it's a value of information exercise, really, to collect the information uh, so you can make better decisions. Yeah. And it, and it, it can be very um, it doesn't have to be like spend a ton of money and collect a whole bunch of data and that maybe isn't important. Maybe some of it is, some of it isn't. So um, one of the great things a geomechanics person can do for a client is help guide them in that, like explain to them what are the most critical types of data to collect. You said one of the interesting uh, observations from Fred Dupree's paper was use the highest mud weight. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I, I think um, the idea there is just um, instead of trying to keep the mud weight low and increasing it in a, in a reactive way as problems start to happen, that the best way to mitigate costs is to just start with that higher mud weight and not have all those issues that may or may not lead to a major problem. But it, it, it definitely, I see in almost every well, is the mud weight starts low and they only increase it when they need to. But by then, they've already had some breakouts and those will continue to cause some issues. Um, you can't put the rock back. <laughs> by increasing the right. mud weight, you don't fix the problems that you already had. Thank you. 
So we probably have time for one more question, so I'll give our audience a couple of minutes to uh, type, and I'll remind everyone that later today you'll receive a recording of today's webinar that you can share with your colleagues. You'll get an evaluation form, a link to registration details for the class that Amy Fox will be teaching on reservoir scale geomechanics for SCA in July in Houston. And it looks like we've answered all the questions, so uh, thanks, Amy, for your presentation today, and we look forward to seeing you in July. Great. Bye. Thank you very much.